the Pez thing, right? Yeah. And you know, my my wife, who was my fiance at the time, uh, you know, whenever she hears about it, she rolls her eyes as well, and she's kind of like. Well, oh, geez, tell them I'm a management consultant. <laughs> tell them I have a master's degree in molecular biology. You know, I am not just this little Pez candy collector. Um, but no, the, the inspiration, it was, that was part of the inspiration, but frankly, it was a small part of it for me. I didn't, at the beginning, I didn't get the human side of it that that story really embodies now, which is it's a, that's the most important asset and the most important thing of eBay is the human side now. But at the beginning, I didn't get that. Um, for me, it was an experiment. It was, like, you know, as, as like I said, I wanted to create an efficient market where individuals could could benefit from participating in an efficient market, kind of level the playing field. Uh, and um, I thought, gee, the internet, the web, it's perfect for this. Uh, and this was more of an intellectual pursuit, you know, than anything else. It was just an idea that I had, and I started it as an experiment, uh, as a side hobby, basically. Um, while I had my day job, and it just kind of, it grew, you know, within six months, it was earning revenue that was paying my costs. Within nine months, the revenue was more than I was making at my day job, and that's kind of when the light bulb went off, and you know, knock, 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 you know, you've got a business here, <laughs> you know, do something about it. So that's when that really started. If you think about it, commerce and trade is at the, is at the base of all human activity. You know, and it's a bit of an exaggeration, but I, I like to talk about, you know, in the old days, people would bring their stuff to market and they'd do business and then they'd go back to, you know, their, their hillside homes or wherever. And uh, eventually they were doing this enough that you had to build a wall around them to, you know, to protect them. And that was the birth of cities and so forth. And again, gross generalizations and simplifications. But fundamentally, everything we do in human activities is related to trade. And, it, and there's something I think that's wired in human beings uh, that that drives us to commerce. I'm not sure what it is exactly, but the human side. So that's the human side I'm referring to. With eBay, it became apparent very quickly because in order to do a trade, a transaction with someone, you actually have to get to know that person and build a trusting relationship first. So you have to build trust before you will enter into a transaction. And so in order to build trust, you have to communicate. You have to get to know one another. Uh, and so very quickly, I started getting letters about, actually, some of the early letters were more negative. They were, you know, this guy's a jerk kind of thing. And I said, okay, there's some human element to that I wasn't expecting. Please be nice. You know, not everyone is a jerk. Maybe there's a misunderstanding. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, but, uh, you know, so very, very quickly, I learned that it was actually the human element that was really driving it more than, more than the commerce. So that's kind of interesting. For the first, uh, I think, three years, uh, at least the first two full years of our history, we grew at 20 to 30 percent every single month. And I don't think any other business has seen, I mean, every business in a startup phase sees that kind of growth for a short period of time, but for such an extended period of time. And so as we were doing projections in terms of, okay, so this is what we've seen in the past, you know, what can we project for growth next year or next quarter or whatever so we can do budgeting and, and all that, um, we would only say, well, this can't last. You know, this can't last. There's no way you can grow this, this fast. Um, so clearly, there's no way I anticipated it. And even as we were growing, like even with smart people, when I finally hired you know business people to actually you know look at this thing, um, everyone would say, I don't know, there's no way it can continue to grow this fast. But it has, which is remarkable. I knock on wood, or, or the nearest thing, you know, every time I, I think about it. Um, just with a great community of people that embrace the idea, embrace the values, because it's all about treating each other, you know, the way you want to be treated yourself, uh, so that you can do business with one another, uh, that it, the business just grew, uh, you know, on its own. And we just had to kind of get out of the way and, and let it grow. Um, so from that side, uh, it, you know, I, I I, uh, I know that the job of a typical entrepreneur is a lot harder than that, because I'd done that before, actually. I, I was a co-founder of another company before, before eBay. Um, so we had it a lot easier than, than, than most. When we went to raise money, for example, um, rather than trying to convince people to invest in eBay, um, we had to tell people to 
stop knocking on the door, basically. And we had our selection, and you know, we made a choice and found a strategic partner, and we took their money and we put it in the bank and we never touched it. So I mean, yeah, we've been. It's mostly success, um, especially in the early early days of eBay. What that brought with it, though. Because of the enormous growth and, and success, it brought a lot of challenges too. You can't predict growth and success. No one in their right mind would predict 30% growth for another year, every month, I mean, monthly growth for another year. Um, so we were behind on a lot of things, on a lot of the infrastructure. And uh, we had some fairly public failures um, in the middle of 99 and where our systems went down for 22 hours and then went down for eight hours after that. And uh, we had a very a large community then, I mean, you know, not as large as today, obviously, but uh, still very large. Front page news, we had CNN satellite trucks in the parking lot. I mean, it was, it was big, big. The world is watching. This company is gone. It's going away. Um, and uh, I think failure of that magnitude uh, or a challenge of that magnitude is, is, is really important, and I'm glad that we face it so early in our evolution because Meg, who's the CEO, I, I brought on uh, Meg uh, in uh, uh, March of 98, um, she really woke up to the fact that infrastructure and technology was critical and um, just really built that organization out over the next, it was a six to nine month process for us to kind of get over that. And, and so I think, I think those challenges are also really critical, really important. And, and uh, what you learn from them is, of course, kind of what, you know, what they say is, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Um, and it's true. And, and what you learn from those challenges and those failures are what will get you past the next ones. You know, I, uh, I was the pretty consistent bull and the cheerleader on on eBay actually um, I just I felt once I realized the human connection that people were, were making with one another over the service um, I just knew that there's just nothing that can happen that can make it go away and even after a massive outage like that you know you you really anger your community they they're depending on a lot of them depended on us at that time for their livelihood still do today um, so it's really a hardship. Even after that, they come back. And they, they say, okay, well, we know you're doing your best. We're with you. And so I've always had, uh, you know, I've always had kind of this unshakable faith that um, it's going to endure. I hesitate to say that, like, eBay is going to, you know, it's kind of the the way all business is going to be done or, or the internet, all business is going to move to, you know, electronic commerce. Not at all. I mean, there's still, you still want to go to the mall. You still want to socialize there. You still want to, you know, there, there's, there's a definite um, value and a reality to the real world experience. Um, but I do think that what eBay did really was kind of, it, it was create a new market, one that wasn't really there before, and that was a global market for the kind of goods that were usually traded at flea markets and garage sales and this kind of thing. And that was the form, that was the start of it, and it hadn't existed before. And uh, now it's, it's progressed past that into consumer electronics, computers. You know, a lot of people don't know that, uh, and I'll put a plug in for my business here, but they don't know that kind of every category that we're in, aside, in addition to collectibles, we're the number one leader in terms of the dollars traded in that category on the internet, except for books and music, because there's another company that's pretty good at that. <laughs> But I mean, consumer electronics, computer equipment, uh, sporting goods, everything. It's jewelry. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. So, so that base of kind of the flea market base has really evolved into a market for pretty much everything. I founded the company on the notion that people are basically good and that if you give them the benefit of the doubt, you're, you're rarely disappointed. And I'm thankful that, in fact, statistics have borne that out to be true. And it is actually 99.999% of our transactions happen without a case of reported fraud. There are 30 cases out of every 1 million transactions where somebody actually goes to the trouble to report fraud. So 
presumably there's some unreported level as well that's higher than that. People don't bother. Um, but that is, it's, there's no word to describe it. It's far more than a, a large majority or most, you know, or whatever. I mean, it's, it's practically all transactions happen without a problem. Um, now, as the absolute number of transactions has, have gone up, this is another challenge that we've faced, is that uh, the absolute number of problems has also gone up. And so with the attention that's paid on the company, I mean, you can open the newspaper on any given day and read about the latest you know, problem that's related to eBay somehow. You know, whether it's some kind of strange new item being offered on the site or an illegal item or, or whatever. And so we've had to evolve our, uh, our uh, strategies and our policies from what I built in the beginning, which was a self-policing community of people, uh, to, um, to one where we take a more active role in trying to identify the, you know, the help identify the bad actors. We work with the authorities to go find them to make sure they don't come back. Uh, and this sort of thing. You know, this is the first time we have statistical proof, right? I mean, here it is. You know, it's a wide open marketplace, yet only 30 out of 1 million transactions. And it's amazing that that has stayed, that, uh, you know, ratio has stayed true since we first started measuring it in January of 98. It was like 27 that month. And, e and so even as the number of transactions has exploded, that ratio is still true. The founding standards, again, were that it was a self-policing community and the community would decide for itself what was, you know, what was appropriate and what was not appropriate. And I created a system of uh, the feedback forum, which I'm very proud of because it's been copied gazillions of times. It was my idea. Um, but, uh, uh, and so it allows people to kind of rate each other, give feedback on how their transaction went. And if they don't like something that somebody's doing, enough people don't like it, that person is automatically kicked off of the system. So that worked very well in the early days. Uh, as we grew uh, and the community became more diverse, um, we found that there are certain types of, certain categories of goods that we just, that the majority of the community just didn't want to see. Even though maybe it's protected or even though, um, you know, it, it's legal. I mean, for, first of all, illegal goods were never allowed on eBay, never. Um, but legal but questionable goods we've had to be more active on. And you mentioned AK-47. So firearms, for example, uh, we decided um, a while back, I think in 98, pretty early on, uh, to, um, I actually, I'm not sure about the date, frankly, but we decided to uh, remove those from the site to say, you know what, eBay is no longer an appropriate venue to trade firearms. And the reason is that the regulations in all the states are so different and so varied that it was hard, it was very easy for a, a member to accidentally trip over a regulation. Uh, and we didn't want them to get into trouble. And at the same time, frankly, you know, Meg's point of view was like, we don't actually, uh, you know, if somebody buys a gun on eBay and uses that to harm somebody, like, we don't actually want that. So in her mind, she was uncomfortable with it actually from the day she joined the company. So, we, you know, we, we got rid of that. Um, adult items is another interesting issue. We had a little lively panel discussion on that was related to that uh, earlier today. Uh, we actually surveyed our members uh, once a while back uh, in a broad survey about a number of things, but it turned out that uh, we asked whether or not this category, this adult category should be removed because there is an adult category on eBay that's segregated from the rest. And 70% of them said, no, keep it. And this was a general broad survey, you know. So you know, we think community standards have to be respected. And uh, as long as we segregate this category away from, uh, from minor, not only minors, because minors aren't supposed to use the site anyway, but we prevent the, uh, a minor from even viewing the items, then I think we're doing a good job there and uh, you know, addressing that concern. So. I was born in Paris, Paris, France. Um, I lived there until I was six years old, actually, and uh, went to bilingual school uh, as I was growing up during that period, so I learned English. Uh, and at age six, moved to the United States, moved to the east coast of the U.S., Washington, D.C. area. Uh, grew up in the D.C. area, actually, through high school. Had a brief stint, actually, in Hawaii, uh, junior high school, eighth and ninth grades. Uh, then back to the uh, uh, Washington, D.C. area, college in Boston. 
and then after college moved to California. It's kind of a resume of where I've been. The longest I was in, in one place was actually college, was four years. Before that was the last three years of high school. And uh, before that was really, we were moving every two to three years. I wasn't part of a military family, which is usually the cause of that. Um, it just kind of happened, I guess. I didn't really realize until we moved after ninth grade, which was our, my last year in, in Hawaii, that uh, I missed people. I mean, I'd finally, in eighth and ninth grade, started to make some really close friends uh, in school, and uh, w leaving after ninth grade was, was kind of tough. Um, it was tough for me personally. Uh, before that, it was just kind of, it was what I knew. It was the way, the way I was you know, raised, and, and it was fine. There just weren't a lot of kids around, and uh, you know, I think as, when I was younger, actually, I ended up hanging out with adults a lot more because I had to, um, you know, and I guess if you forced me to look back, and, and you know, in retrospect, I, I may have been uh, cheated a little bit on the childhood side. You know, I didn't. I kind of grew up very quickly and, and became a little bit more, uh, you know, a little more mature more quickly, I think, than than I see some of my relatives, you know, these days. I was actually interested in gadgets. Um, you know, little electronic gadgets, whether it was calculators. Actually, I remember uh, early on going out shopping for a calculator, and this was when calculators were like $100, you know. Um, I mean, and uh, with my dad, I think. Uh, and so I, I was always fascinated by these little gadgets, and I, I always managed to break them for one reason or another, of course, I, as kids do. Uh, and then I would take them apart and try to fix them, which I was never able to. <laughs> so. You know, I think it's uh, um, both my, my mom and my dad, uh, they were actually separated when I was two, I think. Uh, but my dad was always part of my life. I, I lived with my mom, but uh, my dad was always around. And um, I had, uh, you know, I do, I, I remember younger, uh, when I was, uh, yeah, I remember when I was younger actually spending uh, weekends with my dad, who's a, a surgeon, a medical doctor, doing rounds with him. And we would, you know, spend maybe 45 minutes in the car going from one hospital to the next, and we'd have some great conversations. Uh, and I think that was, that's one of my, you know, fond childhood memories, I think. My dad had the fascinating, and he still does have a fascinating uh, kind of grasp of all, all things, you know, and talk about history and, and talk about art. And when I say conversation, actually, probably that's not quite accurate. It was mostly one way. Um, and I think now that I'm older, I'm, you know, I'm 33 now, I, I think he might have, uh, uh, if I was in his shoes, I'd think, well, you know, this kid isn't hearing anything I'm saying, probably, you know, from my reaction. But it's funny that now that I look back on it, it's a, you know, it was a precious time for me. I was one of these guys, I think, that didn't really study. Um, so I don't think I was a good student. I was not a good student. In college, and I'll tell you, tell you this, um, I am very proud to say that I graduated from Tufts University with better than a 3.0 average. I, it was actually 3.01. And during my entire, uh, uh, you know, my four years there at Tufts, my GPA actually improved every single semester, which gives you an idea of where I started. So, um, no, I, don't, I was not a good student. I was not. I've I've been asked before, you know, kind of informally, you know, kind of like who are your heroes and, and these types of questions, and I'm always I always find it hard to identify, uh, you know, a single, you know, person or a single book or or, or this sort of thing. Um, I've always been kind of more, you know, just forward looking, and I've always I, I guess I was raised with the notion that uh, you can do pretty much anything you you want you, you know you're able to accomplish anything you set out to accomplish um, so I was I was given this sense of confidence um, and I guess I never really felt the need to to uh, or, or I've never had the benefit I should probably say of being inspired really by you know outside kind of heroes so it's a little bit hard hard to say I've always been into the gadgets and I guess when uh, when I first saw a computer um, I'm trying to think if it was third, it might have been third grade, it was pretty early on actually, uh, and it was an early TRS-80 
you know, Radio Shack, kind of the original Radio Shack TRS-80 computer, 4K of memory. I think this one had the 4K or the 8K expansion module, which was like as big as a desk, you know, uh, and uh, learned how to program BASIC on it. And I used to actually cut Jim, <laughs> sneak into the computer room, which wasn't really a room, it was a closet where they kept the computer between classes and play on the, play on the computer. I always kind of just went ahead and tried things. And one of the things I learned later, you know, more kind of professionally, uh, is that a lot of people don't just go ahead and try things. Like they'll have an idea and they'll say, they'll convince themselves or other people will convince them that it can't be done, you know, one or the other. And actually I think that the first is even is more, more dangerous and more uh, serious, is convincing yourself that it can't be done. Uh, and I never learned that for some reason, so I, I just kind of had this uh, naive approach to, well, gee, you know, why not? I'll just go ahead and do it. That was my professional debut, six bucks an hour, and it was, it's funny, too, with thinking about it, because it was, it was using computer technology, right, to print out library cards for the card count. And so all it was was a program to just format, you know, somebody would type in the information and it would format it the way the librarian wanted so they could put the cards in the card catalog. So, you know, this is like incredibly basic computer technology. <laughs> this is no database there, no search engine, you know, nothing like that. Um, but yeah, six dollars an hour. And also, I, uh, at that time, I also uh, uh, worked on the software to help schedule classes which was key, this was in uh, high school, uh, 10th or 11th grade, I think when I was working on that. And, you know, I resisted the temptation to, you know, to put in some code in there to make sure I never had classes on Friday, you know, because I wouldn't have been able to get away with it, but I thought about it. I always wanted to be involved with computers. My, my original kind of career choice, what I thought I was gonna do, was more computer engineering, which was, I thought, you know, figure out the hardware and the software, combine the two to, to learn about computers. Uh, when I got to college at, at Tufts, I was accepted into the engineering school to do an electrical engineering, computer engineering program. Uh, I learned quickly there in my uh, first semester, um, actually my, well, I learned very quickly that the engineering program was a little bit too rigorous for me. And I took a class, I took a chemistry class, I think that was second semester of freshman year. Uh, because it was required for the engineering program, taking chemistry. I had no interest in chemistry. And I have worked, I worked so hard for that class, trying to understand what was going on, and study for the tests and everything. Did so poorly. I remember for the midterm, I studied harder than I had for anything else and got a 25 out of 100 on the test. And it was at that point I said, you know what? Like, this is kind of ridiculous. So I transferred out of the engineering college, went to liberal arts, and just did the pure uh, computer science. When I was in college, I taught myself how to program the Macintosh. Um, a big foundation, actually, for that was a class. It was actually, so it wasn't completely self-taught. It was uh, uh, a C programming class called Data Structures. It was the big, kind of the weed out class for the computer science program. Learned how to program C. Great, great professor. Uh, probably one of the best uh, I've ever had. Um, and a couple things stem from that story. Uh, the first is that that professor eventually had to leave the school. He was, he was a great teacher, but apparently he never published anything. And um, so they asked, you know, like he had to leave. And that was a scandal, you know, at least in my mind. Um, so I don't know what exactly that taught me, but it did have an impact on me. And uh, yeah. And then the second, uh, you know, I, I learned how to program C, and then I used that ability to uh, teach myself how to program the Macintosh, which I was just very excited about learning everything I could about it. Uh, and of course, that's how I began actually my professional career, it was uh, after college, actually a year before graduating from college, uh, I uh, uh, took a summer job in California working at a software company for the Macintosh. I was just pursuing what I enjoyed doing. I mean, I was pursuing my passion. Um, and the whole, you know, the ability to create software that could have a, a benefit or an impact on people that used it was what was driving me. And so I was driven by, you know, mass market software and the, the whole notion of just being able to do neat things. 
And like most, you know, uh, software people, it is very much a uh, it is very much a passion more than anything else. And so, like people have said, it's not really work. You know, if you're if you're having fun, it's not work. So, that's that was the case with me. I've got a passion for solving a problem that I think I can solve in a new way. And that maybe it helps that nobody's done it before as well. I mean, we always have a, you know, there's a sense of pride of doing something brand new. Uh, and I'm particularly inspired by, by uh, problems that seem easily solvable. Not, you know, not the difficult problems that some of the physicists that are here, for example, you know, are talking about, but problems that seem easily solvable that no one's bothered to, to attack because they think it's impossible. You know, uh, and so with eBay, I mean, it was the whole the whole idea there was just to help people do business with one another on the internet, and people thought it was impossible because how could how could people on the internet remember this was 1995? How could they uh, trust each other? How could they get to know each other? And I thought that was silly. You know, it was a silly concern because people are basically like good, honest people. Um, so that you know that was very motivating. It was gee, I'll just do it. I'll just, I'll show them. You know, let's, let's see what happens. Oh, if they, if, if they say, I want to do exactly what you did and compete with eBay, I say, yeah, don't bother. <laughs> don't quit your day job. <laughs> um, no, but that's pretty rare. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I love actually coming to these kinds of venues where I talk to students and, and young people because they, they have, they're very passionate and they have great ideas. Uh, and what I tell them is a, a number of things. First of all, um, I say that you know you should pursue your passion. If you're passionate about something and you work hard, then I think you'll be successful. If you if you start a business because you think you're going to make a lot of money at it, then you probably won't be successful because that's the wrong reason to start a business. You have to really believe in what you're doing, be passionate enough about it so that you will put in the hours and the hard work that it takes to actually succeed there, and then, then you'll be successful. And, and, I, you know, and I have a couple other little things I tell them. I say, um, you know, when you look at the accomplishments of, of uh, accomplished people, and you say, boy, that must have been really hard. You know, when you look at something that looks hard, that was probably easy. And conversely, when you look at something that looks easy, that was probably hard. And so you're never going to know which is which until you actually go and do it. So just go and do it, try, learn from it. You, you know, you'll fail at some things. That's a learning experience that you need so that you can take that on to the next experience. Um, and don't let people who you may respect uh, and who you believe know what they're talking about, don't let them tell you it can't be done. Because often they will tell you it can't be done. And uh, it's just because they don't have the courage to try it. I think absolutely nice guys can make it. Um, in fact, especially in, in my business, eBay, uh, which is all based on people doing business with one another. You know, take a little aside here, attacking that question. What I tell people all the time, internally and externally, about, about eBay is that it's, if it's, uh, it's not like a retail experience. If you think about a retail environment where people are buying things in a retail environment, the retailer has a whole bunch of control. They choose the products, they design the store or the catalog, they train the salespeople, they, they control the experience. And if there's a problem with a, sale, you know, with a salesperson, they retrain and so on and so forth. At eBay, our customer's experience is based on how one customer interacts with another customer. Okay? And you can't control customer behavior. So the only thing you can do is have a certain set of values that you encourage people to adopt. And the only way your customers are going to adopt those values is if they see that you're living those values as well. So when I say that I believe people are basically good, it's because I believe people are basically good. I mean, it's not something that I came up with for eBay. And if I say that you should treat people with the benefit of the doubt, it's because I believe in that as a way of life. And we have to do it internally at eBay, at the company as well, because if we don't, then eventually that seeps through and customers will see that. And that will harm our business because you know, we can't control customer behavior, so our business is based on that. So it's a long-winded way of saying that 
you know, nice guys, quote unquote, uh, you know, a responsible company that's, that has its heart in the right place, that is a real human, that's run by real human beings, um, it has to be successful because if we weren't that way, eBay would not be successful. eBay wouldn't exist. It would not be possible. So, uh, so there you go. The big opportunity that I see now is uh, kind of shepherding this this wealth that's been created into our into our uh, philanthropic goals, and um, those goals have to do with kind of rekindling a, a sense of community, uh, reminding people that there's a there's a, a benefit there's an it's important to be part of your community, and there's a benefit that comes with being part of your community, and that's something that in America we've lost a little bit, I think, but but the value is still there. The uh, the, the, in fact, the core values of community are still there in America, and they just need to be rekindled a little bit, I think. I look at it as a, as a, as a deep and heavy responsibility, in fact, to make sure that that wealth goes to good use. Because it, it's very simple. Um, an enormous amount of wealth has been created uh, in, this, in this business, in my, just even in my business. And it's, it's, uh, it is un, it's unmeasurable. My personal wealth is far beyond what any normal human being will ever need in their lifetime for themselves, for their family, for their descendants, for generations. You know, a small, small piece of, of, of what I have uh, is enough for that. And so the rest of it, I don't want to see it go to waste. So I have a responsibility to make sure it's put to good use. And, uh, you know, I mean, I feel... I'm, a, I'm benefiting from the market success of a great business that has been built by regular, ordinary people who are, you know, logging on every day and doing business with one another. And, uh, you know, that's, that's something that it's, I have to give back. I mean, it's just, you know, I have to do it. You know, I have to, I have to make sure that, uh, that, that, uh, that that wealth is put to good use. So we are... It's a learning process, I think, for us and for my wife and I, as we as we think about that. Um, and you know, as I as I've said, we uh, we have 50 years ahead of us, hopefully, at least, as philanthropists. Um, so we've got you know, a long-term horizon here. So. There are a number of issues. Definitely, the internet is changing everything. It has changed the world in such a short period of time and will continue to change things in very positive ways that we've yet to anticipate, I believe. Um, at the same time, the, just the, if, you, if you look at it in just this last few years of time, the market um, has gotten a little bit, got away from itself a little bit. And a lot of businesses were created that should never have been created, that should never have been funded, that should never have been brought to the public markets. Um, and it created an impression that it was really easy to make a lot of money with a stupid idea, basically. And so a lot more people said, gee, great, you know, that, it's working for that guy, so I should come in and, and do the same thing. And whereas, you know, MBA candidates just a few years ago, MBA graduates a few years ago, were going into consulting jobs and, and, and the like, um, now they're all starting up companies. And, you know, some of that, it's a good thing. I mean, I want people to try. I want people to be entrepreneurs and, and, and go out and try it. But I want them to do it for the right reasons, because they think they can change the world, because they think they've got something of value to give to the world, not because they think they can make a lot of money. That's the wrong way to do anything. And so it's created a bit of a, there's been a bit of a negative effect on, uh, on the valley, in particular, Silicon Valley. We left Silicon Valley. We don't live there anymore, partly for that reason. Um, and uh, it's created also a bit of a negative effect, I think, with consumers as well, in that it's created uh, unrealistic expectations in some cases. The expectation that a valuable service should be pro provided free of charge. And in some cases, that a valuable service should be provided only if the service provider pays you as a customer. So it's worse than free. You know, so I, it's some crazy things like that. And I think it's going to take, it's going to take some time to unwind and recover from that. You know, in, uh, in Silicon Valley, it is, uh, I think, I think there's, there's been a big problem in the last few years. Um, 
public servants like police officers and firemen and teachers and, and so forth cannot live in the communities that they serve. They can't afford to own a home, much less even rent a home in those communities. They drive two hours to get to work every day. And when you have you know, your, your, your community beat cop police officer you know, not being a part of your community, that, that's bad. That, that really hurts. Um, not to mention other, you know, other service workers and, and, uh, and uh, you know, other lower wage earners that have just had to leave. Um, it's a problem. It's a serious problem. I'm very excited by, by the prospect of what we haven't seen yet. You know, it's the year 2000 now. The web was invented in 93. People graduating from college this year entered college with the web. And just in a, in a matter of years, people graduating from college will have entered high school with the web. And it will, it will have existed as part of their, their being. You know, I'm, I'm too old for that. I, I grew up kind of in the, in, the, in the software world. You know, I grew up in a, in a technology environment, but it was software. And it was all about building software packages that could solve people's problems and change the world. But now, kids are, are, are growing up and going into the workforce uh, with the background of growing up with the web with a global communication medium that is interactive, that people can, you know, congregate around. Uh, and I think it's, it's exciting to see what kinds of ideas they will come up with, things that are just that the world has never seen before. So that's, that's what I'm waiting for. If we can help people reconnect with their communities, uh, I think we can work together as a global community and solve the world's problems. You know, it's a bit idealistic, but we're, we're really looking kind of for second order effects in what we're doing. In other words, if we can just get people to just reconnect with their community, just realize that you're an individual, but you have a responsibility to be part of your community. And that responsibility is not just a burden, but it also comes with benefits that are real tangible benefits that you'll see being a part of that community. Um, then just think if, if everyone thought like that, you could actually tackle local community problems, homelessness, you know, health care, I mean, just serious problems. And you could tackle global problems as well. Because we now have, again, a global communications medium, and communities are being built not just in the real world, but in the virtual world as well. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that the reconnection with community, that I actually, frankly, I, I first became passionate about because of eBay, because I saw it happen on eBay, um, I'm very hopeful that that reconnection is going to dramatically improve the world.